Donald Trump, the hottest topic of the current election year. We believe that Trump's policies are baffling to most of the world. Building a giant wall and asking Mexicans to pay for it, barring Muslims from entering the country, and even condemning long-standing ally NATO. But although it seems unsustainable and weird, we believe that Trump's supporters, who truly know his policies and who truly wants to live in Trump's world, should still be eligible to vote. What we don't want is when people vote for Trump just because he's an apprentice, or just because he creates crafty nicknames for Hillary, or just because of his temperament that they like. That's why a political knowledge test is so important for voting in today's society, because voting is about knowing what's best for ourselves. So this debate is not about taking away the votes of the poor or those who have far right or far left political leanings. But this debate is about equipping voters with the knowledge that is crucial whatever political leaning they may have. Today we have a four prompt mechanism. First, voting no thank you will still be for those above 18. So this political test will be conducted regularly, coinciding with important elections such as mayoral, governoral, or parliamentary elections in every country. This includes, for example, basic knowledge about parties, basic knowledge about candidates, and each of their policies and their stances in that election year. On Third, that point, we can see that there will be a number of people that will not be able to pass a test but we still want these people to be able to fulfill their right to vote. That's why we will have socialization campaigns about party manifestos, about ideologies, and even give these people, for example, free subscription of newspaper or even the economists for them to be truly well informed and pass this general knowledge test. And fourth, this test will be free and we will provide a national holiday for people to take this test so people truly from all sex of society, even those who are poor, can still participate in this test. So under this principle, we'll take three arguments in today's debate. I will talk about the principle of an informed decision and also how we'll drive good policies at the end of the day. While my second speaker will talk about increasing accountability. But before I move on to my arguments, the POI. Okay, so uh, certain groups within society here I won't be likely to vote into this policy. So how can you justify removing the government's accountability from those groups like the poor and minorities? We're not removing the government's accountability because we still want the poor to be able to vote. We don't think that just because you're poor, you don't have general political knowledge. You can still watch TV, you can still read the free subscription of newspapers that we give to you. So we think that we still accommodate their interests. So under our principle, we believe that our principle is basically extending our current laws that children cannot vote. We think that voting requires rationality because all decision making requires an informed choice. Why? Let's look at examples. Before driving, you need to have a test so that you might feel that you can drive, but without the test, you won't be able to harm yourself in the process. Or for example, you have age limits on alcohol because you can harm yourself when you're drunk. But we believe that age limits work on alcohol because we already have these precautions and societal information and this is a relatively simple decision making on whether you want to be drunk or not. But for political decisions, it's very nuanced. You're talking about economies, you're talking about health, you're talking about defense and military. So we don't think that just because you're 18, you suddenly know about all these things. You still need to have to pass a general political knowledge test. Which brings me to the parameter that an uninformed decision may actually harm yourself. How exactly? First of all, this relates to representation. So we think that currently, a lot of people vote just because of party lines, just because of family, family tradition, or depending on arbitrary factors, such as affiliation on race and gender. We think that they may feel represented in the short run, for example, I feel alike to this candidate. But in the long run, they cannot guarantee that these candidates will actually deliver the policies that they want, because they themselves don't even understand what policies this politicians offer on, that on the point, table. Yeah. We think that this is a significant harm when you don't feel represented because it turns out the policy actually disadvantages you at the end of the day because you don't even know what the policy is at the start to begin with. At this point, after you voted these people, you will already feel an irreversible impact for the decision. For example, just because a candidate is popular doesn't mean he will suddenly reduce the welfare, uh, re increase the welfare budget. And this means that if you're living under less than $10 a day and you just vote for a candidate just because he's popular, you might not necessarily get those welfare benefits you're seeking for. Or just because you identify with a certain race or certain gender, it doesn't mean that that man or that woman will promote these feminist policies or will promote these policies that will advantage your race nation. And that's why we think that people should really understand the policies and the ideologies of these candidates on the table. 
Aside from this physical and tangible harm, we also feel that there's another harm involved, which is how people will feel regret. They don't feel represented. And within this very important in democracies, representation is basically the key and the essence of voting. So in so, conclusion, we believe that uninformed vote will be an unrepresentative choice and that's a harm in itself, regardless of impact. Yes. Some people choose to vote based on attitudes, based on character. Tell me why those are illegitimate qualified qualities. We think that attitude and character should be balanced with understanding of policies. We think that that can be accommodated both under our side of the house, that you truly know that these attitudes will actually translate to policies that will benefit yourself in the future. So going on to my second argument, which is about how we'll push for better policies. So in the status quo, we see politicians, once again, such as Donald Trump, advocating for policies to build walls in Mexico by saying that Mexico's, Mexicans are basically rapists and thieves, or maybe Nigel Farage, that use retorts of immigrants coming into our country and stealing our jobs. We believe that these politicians garner substantial support, not because of their policies, but because of their rhetoric and their personalities. And we think that this is unsustainable. But why is this the case? No, thank you. Because people advocate for politicians on the basis of these arbitrary characteristics and rhetorics, and they're easily swayed. This is the very reason that this is bad, because politicians can capitalize on this loophole and maximize the abilities to come up with rhetorics, rather than maximize their capabilities to actually ensure that their policies is in line with their voting basis wants, to make sure that their policies will actually benefit their constituents, instead of trying to craft up the most inventive campaign, for example, by putting images on a bus or on the on the billboard in front of your house. So we think that it's very important for these people to actually advocate for policies. So how does our model solve this and how we achieve this goal? On that point, we think that we're tackling the root of the problem, which is the ignorance that most people have or society over political matters that have been heavily capitalized by politicians. Under our model, people will have the incentive because they want to use their vote to actually benefit themselves and will actually try to learn about these things and actually pass the test. Why is this good? Because politicians have no other way to win the election rather than creating sustainable policies that will actually benefit their constituencies, they just generally. They can no longer rely on the very rhetorics that they use because people cannot just vote based on looks or based on rhetorics anymore, but also based on an understanding of the policies. So there will be greater public scrutiny about what will you do once you become president, for example, by learning from these sort of televised debates from these newspapers. And we think that that's very important because politicians politicians actually have an incentive to stay in power. So what they will do is that they will actually give these policies to the people who now judge them not just based on these retorts, but based on these policies. We believe that this is sustainable because of what my second speaker will bring, which is about the whole principle of accountability in today's debate. In conclusion, politicians have no other way but push for better policies. The burden for the opposition team today is to prove that people will feel fulfilled and will feel represented by the vote, even with an uninformed decision. And that's why we think their proposition will win today's debate. Thank you. Speaking time was 8 minutes and 15 seconds. Thank you for the speech. I'd now like to call Sean Lee. Can you maybe use one minute between speeches? Okay. Uh, I can sign up to okay. you. English politician Tony Bent once said, democracy transfers power from the wallet to the ballot. What people once couldn't afford for themselves, they could now vote for it instead.
team in Indonesia compromises on an entire principle of what democracy means, and on that ground alone, we think they've lost today's debate. Before I move any further, team opposition firstly supports education in, the, in terms of governmental curriculum. We say this can take the form of, say, civic classes in schools, for instance. Secondly, we think that political knowledge is, not some, is something we value, but, and we encourage, but we don't think your voting rights should predicate upon the extent of your political knowledge. Before that, two points of contention. Firstly, is their model justified in principle? And secondly, how will their model look like in practice? So firstly, let's talk principles. What do we hear? We hear the statement that Team Indonesia do not want people to vote for Trump because he's an apprentice. Then his next line was, I quote, voting is voting what's best for ourselves. This is a contradiction, ladies and gentlemen, because who are you to place a value judgment as to what is best for themselves? Thank you. If some people think that Donald Trump is a suitable candidate for themselves because he's an apprentice, who are you to say that that's not a legitimate way to vote, for instance? We don't think it's right for you to place a value judgment on people based on how they vote. We think the way they vote should be respected and we are going to value just that. They then told us that, okay, our model is an extension of the principle that children cannot vote. Firstly, this is completely false. The reason why children cannot vote is because they are impressionable. They can be affected by the way their parents yes, vote. They lack the kind of dependence, you know, thank you, sir. This means that it's not the same reason as to why your model insists. But secondly, even if we take your entire principle and take it to its highest ground, let's take it down from there. We put to you that there's a qualitative difference between children voting and people voting under your model. Because the people whom you're going to target and now no longer have the right to vote are usually people who fail the test. Who are these kind of people? These are people who are usually in structural poverty, and that's why are uneducated. This means that ultimately, it's significantly harder to get out of structural poverty and then pass the test and get the right to vote as it is to say, grow up to 18, not get killed, and then get the right to vote. We think there's a fundamental distinction here. You need to answer that, the next speaker. Your principle is just not right. We don't stand for that. Now, I'll do the second point of contention on practice. No, well, thank you. So first of all, they told us that individuals will vote without knowing policies and therefore they somehow get harmed. Firstly, I pointed out in the POI, why can't people vote based on character? We didn't hear a very good response other than the fact that, that, that policy can accommodate both. We agree, your policy can accommodate both people for voting for A, um, their character, and B, on policies. The problem is, you can only accommodate this Sorry. for people who are rich and therefore are educated. The more affluent backgrounds, so thank you, people who are from higher income groups and are more educated and pass the test. How about for every single other individual in the world? You have no response for that point on your side of the house. But not more than we say that we heard this point on how those who fail the test, they can partake in some form of socialization program and they can get and they'll give away free economists. I'm sorry, but do you know how boring The Economist is? There are a lot of people who just don't want to read the newspaper or The Economist. That's the reason why they fail your test to begin with, because they don't read newspapers or The Economist. So what, doesn't really make sense that you're not going to give them the same thing that deters them to begin with. But on a more serious note, ladies and gentlemen, we say, how is their policy any different from the current status quo of campaigning and rallies to begin with? We, if it fails in the status quo, we don't see how your model rectifies the problem. On a last note, they told us that you do not know how to vote when you're 18 because it's on issues like health and economy. Panel, who says the issues to indicate and decide what I vote on must be based upon such issues like the health and economy? Why can't I decide to say vote based on education policies that are more important to me? Or other kinds of things that are more important to me? We don't think it's right for the Indonesia to place a very judgment on what they think is important, but because more than our substantives, yes. And now, please, we push for people to know about economy and also about politics, about everything. So it means that the decisions will have to I know. Com com I, thank you, sir. Yes, you said that you do it through giving away newspapers and socialization, socialization program. The problem is the reason why the people already fail to pass the test in the status quo is the reason is because they don't read these newspapers as often and therefore don't have the kinds of current affairs knowledge background to allow them to pass these tests to begin with. So you are just using the same policy that caused people to fail in your test to begin with. You don't think you resolve anything at all. Now, team will today will follow you with three substantive arguments. Firstly, I'll be talking to you about why those who are subject to the law ought to be able to decide it. Secondly, I'll be talking to you about why team Indonesia's model enable governments to oppress underprivileged groups. And lastly, my second speaker will be talking to you about why their model undermines stable democracies. So firstly, let's talk about why those who are subject to the law ought to be able to decide it. Panel, when citizens live in a state, they cede away and forfeit certain rights and power to the government. We say that in return, the they get a government in a state who represents them and provides welfare for them. This is why we see a lot of policies that try to benefit citizens from instance. We say this is a transaction of rights that happens between citizen 
and the state, where rights are given away by citizens are now compensated in the form of welfare and protection from the government. We say Team Indonesia punishes on this transaction when people are no longer able to get their rights back after giving it away to the government because now they fail the test and not allowed and not allowed to thank you any form of representation whatsoever. And we say that's immoral, that's wrong, and we abhor it. But onto my second perspective, which is the more important one, we say this other house enables governments to oppress underprivileged groups. Panel, the thesis of this point is that Team Indonesia's motto allows the governments to ignore the welfare of groups with low voting records. Worse, in trying to appeal and cater to groups with high turnouts, the government does so at the expense of groups with low turnouts. So let's explain this. Recognize that political parties have always focused their campaigns towards groups that have traditionally favored them. We give you the instance of how 80% of Latino Americans voted for the Democrats in the last two electoral cycles, for instance. Or like how the, like the most low-income groups within Greece vote for the Syriza group, Syriza political party in Greece, for instance. Sir. This is because, hold on, it is cheaper and more effective for these political parties to focus limited resources to convince these groups which have a high chance of voting for them to vote for them. Before I move on any further, yes. Why would the politicians want to get a swing vote from these marginalized groups? Okay, I'll answer your POI right now with my analysis. We say parties would introduce policies in, the, in their manifestos according to the likelihood that groups will vote for them. For instance, if there's a group that will definitely vote for them, they tend to cater a lot of their policies in trying to target them. But for like swing groups like you just mentioned, they tend to cater less policies in trying to focus on them because they need to prioritize the allocation of resources for which the group is more likely to vote for them. This deals with your POI. Now, what happens when Team Indonesia's model comes to pass is that you enable the governments to prioritize the affluent and the higher income groups because these are the groups that tend to be more educated and therefore tend to more pass the test with a higher rate. This means that they allow them to ignore the lower income groups altogether. Why? Because in practice, the higher F the affluent and, more and higher income brackets tend to be more educated and pass the test, whereas the lower income brackets tend to fail the test because they live in structural poverty, for instance. So what does their model look like in practice? Their model means that governments and parties can now allocate less resources and policies at benefiting whole groups, races, ethnicities, and regions of people based on their voting records. We give you an example of how the Brazilian government, under the Workers' Party, craft policies that ignore the people in the impoverished region of Marais as they usually do not vote. We say they allow this on a large scale across all races, all ethnicities, and all kinds of social economic back brackets, and we say that's bad. Panel, recognize that ultimately we need to protect these individuals, but our team Indonesia, the, these governments will now use their resources meant for the rich to continue being targeted to the rich at the expense of the poor people, the people who do not tend to vote or have very low telling numbers, and we say that's wrong. Ultimately, because we reject this notion of what democracy means from this side of the house, but we think it's important to make the poor, we're very proud to oppose. Ladies and gentlemen, realize that political education does not mean ideologies of the effort. That political education does not mean that it is imposed by Democrats or Republicans. 
It is imposed by an objective government. It is imposed through objective standards of political uh, knowledge of different kinds of parties, of political knowledge of different kinds of sectors from economy, healthcare, and so on. The mm -hmm. test is holistic and the test is objective, ladies and gentlemen. The reason why individuals can be swayed by certain rhetorics and will be locked to certain parties is exactly because individuals from the most unaffluent communities do not have political education in the first place. I'm going to show you in my speech why actually individuals will have political education only when we implement this policy. So before I move on to my substantive material, two questions in response. First, in terms of principle, and second, in terms of effectivity of our model. So first, in terms of principle, we found a very weak principle coming from opposition by saying that individuals can choose just because of a certain character. We also agree that to a certain extent, true, they can choose because of a certain character. But we don't think that's a strong principle compared to our principle. That you need to have a holistic ability to decide whether or not something is good for you or not. Just because in the short run you might think that an individual's uh, politics, politicians are actually good just because of certain characteristics of certain behavior, it creates a potential harm that later on, after you vote it, for this particular person, the policies might not be suitable for you. They have completely neglected our example on saying how certain individuals that like Donald Trump, for instance, because he is on the apprentice, might in the future be a part of a non-affluent community that might not get redistribution policies coming from Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen. These kinds of potential harm is exactly what you want political education to have in the, to be happening in the first place. Because only then individuals can actually create the decisions that they want for themselves. Sure, character can be a, a consideration, but we need to make sure that it's not the only consideration because we do not want these individuals to regret in the future. But secondly, sure, our uh, practicality, on we might rely on ourselves on the, uh, on the ability that individuals will actually get political education will actually pass the test. We believe that the majority of individuals will actually pass the test in our case. Why? Because all of the problems saying that current campaigns does not work, that current education does not work, does not make sense in this gentlemen, because they're comparing a test that does not exist in the status quo. Sure, people, they can't say that people don't pass the test right now because there's no test right now. You look at the, the current political education is slow right mindset. now. No, thank you. Because there's no incentive whatsoever for individuals to actually listen towards the campaigns. No incentive whatsoever for individuals to actually listen towards socializations. They also even concede that they only rely on education, they only support education that are coming from government curriculum, which are in the status quo, which also, we might argue, might not be effective enough. But what we give in our model, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, is the incentive for individuals to know that when they want their opinion on to that be point, sir. they have to know about certain things. And when the government in our model has specifically told that socializations, that media coverage being given to those individuals will be holistic, will give objective knowledge to those individuals. Therefore, the individuals now have the incentive to actually read it, to actually at least know a little bit about it, to be able to pass the test and have a general knowledge. We think that this is not something that's exclusively available towards affluent individuals, right? We believe that the problem is right now, it's not because you're inherently poor, it's not because you inherently do not have any knowledge at all, but because you do not have the incentive, you do not have the channel for you to be able to read those things and actually understand them. And that's what we exclusively create on our side of the house. We allow individuals to actually have the capacity to read articles, to actually listen to the campaigns, and not only be swayed by rhetorics. And even if in the end of the day, no thank you, they might only choose by a rhetorics. It's okay, ladies and gentlemen, because at the very least, they actually already know the full extent of their decisions, and that's something that we protect on our side of the house. Meanwhile, they only protect on their side of the house a harm that only exists because there's no political education. They need to prove to us, their better enough proof in this debate, why our policy will actually undermine political education, why our policy will actually make individuals from non affluent communities will be very easily swayed by Democrats and or by Democrats and by something that they've never fulfilled in their current okay. function. Before I move on to my substantive material, yes. There's currently a lot of information available in newspapers which people don't tend to read often. Why do you think people will now read the material you present them on your side of the house? Because the only chance for them to be able to vote is when they actually read it. And when government already says that this test is actually easy, when the government already says that this test actually only requires you to read certain articles, this kind of narrative from the government shows how inclusive the government is towards these individuals, how are they are actually able, they actually have the knowledge, but they're not yet uh, made uh, possible by the government yet. And that's what we give on our side of the house. That's what we protect. Why? That's why I believe that the majority of individuals that we protect on our side of the house will actually get political knowledge 
they're only comparing with status quo with comparing our policy. So now, let's talk about my argument, how this increases accountability. Now currently, it's difficult for individuals to hold politicians accountable. Why? Because it's difficult for individuals to pinpoint a politician's fault. Currently, <coughs> like, uh, parts of media, or experts, or politically knowledgeable individuals, which are not that many, are able On to point actually here. point out the disappointment towards the government. Mm -hmm. But for anyone, yes. Uh, to clarify, what exactly do you characterize as general political knowledge? So if I'm an American voter, do I need to know the Libertarian, libertarian Party's policy? And if yes. so, how many paragraphs of it? Okay, it doesn't have to be a full paragraph, and you do not have to be a Harvard graduate, like, ladies and gentlemen. But you only simply know that there are certain policies that are redistributive in nature, that there are certain policies that are big pro-business in nature. Those kinds of basic knowledge is what we need individuals to know, and that's enough in our side of the house. But now moving on to my substantive material. We believe that currently individuals who are in the majority who will be the future uh, individuals that will be elected as individuals actually do not have enough knowledge about politics. Now, we think that when they know that something, only, uh, only some of them actually knows that something is wrong, they are, are actually in many cases uh, do not know anything. But in some cases, they know something is wrong, they want to say something to the government, but they cannot exactly pinpoint what's wrong, and they cannot create a, a comprehensive case in, against the government. We believe that currently the government has the very good ability to actually squirrel around and convince the society that everything is okay. That convince the society and say that I'm already doing something that's good, you already voted for me, so you need to trust me. We don't think that's a healthy thing to do, ladies and gentlemen. We think that this argument uh, actually follows to, from really bad governments even to some sort of good governments. In terms of really bad governments, we think that in many developing countries, they are already implementing elections that sometimes the system outside of the election are like, still red. For instance, uh, in many developing countries, uh, politicians, you know, presidents uh, choose ministers just because of familial relations. For instance. And we think that these kinds of cases are still legal, but I cannot be held accountable. Because now politicians can always say that this is still judged by America, they, they are still actually competent uh, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. We don't think that this is good. This can only happen when the majority of individuals that elect them actually have basic knowledge about what it takes to be a certain minister. And we think that this can only be allowed when we have the political representation and political knowledge coming from knowing basic stuff about uh, what, what it means as a literature policies or pro-business policies, what it means of libertarian policies or uh, conservative policies, ladies and gentlemen. This kind of basic knowledge will rally up individuals' uh, opinions and rally up support, not just one media expert, not just one certain critics, but everyone, ladies and gentlemen. And this creates the political pressure for uh, uh, for governments, for instance, to review their policies, to actually reshuffle their cabinet, actually change their policies. And for all those reasons, we think that this is good for the individuals who are very proud to propose. Under this motion, governments 
directly or indirectly, are going to be able to systematically take one of the few weapons that poor people and minorities have to make sure states do not actively subjugate them to horrible forms of oppression and ignore them in every aspect of policy. It is absolutely vital that we do not shut people out of democracy just because as a state we have failed to educate them enough about politics and failed to involve them enough about politics. Why ought we to, co to compound state failure in an education system by therefore not allowing them to vote? Completely baffling from Team Indonesia, completely abhorrent. I'm going to do four things in this speech. I'm first of all going to discuss the model we get from Team Indonesia and why it doesn't work. I'm secondly going to discuss on what grounds people ought to have the right to vote and why we win that principle. Third, you will see which side has better policies, and then I'll bring a new piece of substantive where we'll discuss the very harmful consequences for stability and peace within democracies when you shut up large segments of people from the safety valves that democracy offers. Let's begin then with the model. Why doesn't it work? The first question we have is, what is in the text? What is the content of this text, right? It is unclear to us why, if you need to have every piece of information possible, how you can possibly run a test that did not include every single party on the electoral roll as part of that test. As an American voter, even though the Libertarian Party are pretty much irrelevant, under their motion, I probably ought to know about their fiscal policy. I ought to know whether they were shut down the Federal Reserve. I need to know something about those kind of things. Because basically nobody knows about these kind of things, there are huge problematic problems with their policy that they need to engage with. Give us some more detail, please. Secondly, Who's writing this? It's probably going to be the government. That is incredibly problematic for reasons of bias, which I'll get onto later. Their model was totally unclear, and at this point in the debate, seems basically unworkable. We need some more analysis of why it does work. Secondly, when do I get to vote? What are the principles on the table? Indonesia bring us two principles. The first one they bring, it was a little bit unclear. But the, what we gather from it, right, was that if you harm other people with your vote, you shouldn't be able to have it. They used two analogies. The first analogy was alcohol. It's fine that 18-year-olds are able to drink, because at that point in time, no 18-year-old ever gets drunk, no 18-year-old ever makes bad decisions. Like, that was obviously untrue. Just look at it, like, empirical reality. Secondly, driving, right? So, fine, we recognize that you have driving tests, but the point is that there are other ways, and there are cheaper ways of getting to places within almost any society, like using the train or the bus. That is not such a big problem pragmatically. But furthermore, we say, even if these were analogous, the principle does not stand, right? Because if I vote in an election in a perfectly informed way to raise taxes on the rich as a poor person to benefit me, I am harming rich people. Tell us, Team Indonesia, how that is principally wrong. Sir. Why harming somebody else is a reason not to give them the vote. No thanks, guys. The second principle they bring us is that you have to have a list of ability to, uh, sorry, that you should be able to vote on policies and nothing else, right? Sean already tells you quite clearly that this is totally illegitimate. It is a subjective decision, right, to make a, 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 a value judgment on, like, what is valuable in society. Furthermore, we tell you, even if rationality was the only criterion we ought to use, notice that if I vote for Hillary Clinton as a woman, as a woman she probably is likely to do good things for women and is more likely to do so than as a man. Similarly, if I vote for Bill Clinton, I don't vote for Bill Clinton because I don't trust him to be a family man, perhaps I don't trust him on other areas of policy, perhaps he isn't trustworthy. So there are rational reasons to vote on these kind of bases, and it's totally unclear why even if we bought this hyper-rational worldview, we wouldn't be able to do that, right? What did we bring you in terms of the policy? Yes. We can't guarantee whether or not Hillary Clinton will get good policies for women, right? We might assume that, but therefore we need additional information to know whether or not my Bernie Sanders might have better policies for women. Okay, like, no one knows all the information in the world. I can make a rational judgment that Hillary Clinton is better for women than Bernie Sanders if I have only one piece of information. That is a probability judgment. Of course, nobody knows everything about politics, but that is a clear judgment I can make. What we brought to you was that if you are subject to laws, if you have to follow laws, and you have to go to jail if you break those laws, you ought to have some kind of say over what those laws are. They never respond to this principle. We need more engagement with these kind of here. No thanks. Thirdly, do we get better policies, right? Two things to consider here. First of all, the preferences that are being expressed and being considered, right? We give you lots of reasons why there's no enfranchisement. Sean tells you that high income people tend to be more educated, they're more likely to pass these kind of tests. That is unfair to poor people. Secondly, we tell you that poor people are busier. They're working two jobs to make sure that their children don't go to school hungry and that they can afford school clothes. They don't have time, right, to learn more about politics. Get real, please, Team Indonesia. Thirdly, minorities. Minorities often exist in polities that have totally different kinds of parties that would not be represented in a national test, right? Which is problematic because it shuts minorities out of government. Fourthly, we tell you that especially in emerging democracies, even if we concede the notion that if the government is writing a test, it's more like the UK or the US, it's going to be fair about those kind of things. In those kind of countries, they're going to have an influence of the policies. They're going to use it to systematically marginalize other people who might not vote for their party because they stand for something different, right? Do we get better policy making an answer of the House? Third issue. People, we say people's, um, two things to say. First of all, people's um, views need to be expressed, right? So all of those reasons
screens are incredibly problematic and it's important to the debate because it's vital that poor people and minorities who tend to be disenfranchised, who tend to need government policy more than anybody else, are included within policy making. Otherwise, society makes very bad decisions. And in particular, it makes bad decisions that inflict most of the harm on the most vulnerable people who really need government help. But we tell you, even on more informed voting, we win this debate, right? It's also going to have education campaigns. Guys, like, there's no reason we can't do this on our side of the house, first of all. Secondly, we say that not everyone can do this because people are literally so busy to working two jobs they can't even do these kind of tests and do this kind of revision, so they can't read through the economist. Guys, Sorry. it's a long time, trust me. And lo like, on comparison, we say the governments are more likely to just concentrate on the current electorate rather than try and expand it to everybody. If I, if I have to do loads of work as a political party to get poor people to vote for me, why would I not just shaft them and concentrate on everybody else in this society? Makes more sense. Okay, so for all of those reasons, we get worse policies. It's totally principally unjustified. This is it, not good for human nature. But fourthly, we tell you, right, Let's move on to the areas of substantive. that we undermine peaceful and stable democracy. We've told you lots of reasons why these areas will basically become political wastelands. We said that if you never voted because you failed the test, because you're too poor to spend enough time to learn all of the things that you ought to learn according to them, you're going to pass it on to your family. You're, and anyone who even passes the test in reasons that tend to be poor or tend to be focused on minorities, because these people cluster together because of economic factors, right? We say that these areas will be systematically ignored by politicians, will not be engaged with because you're only getting a small return for all the time you're spending talking to them. Why is this problematic? You get vast social and economic problems because the government doesn't solve these issues, as we've already told you. But secondly, we think you raise a spectre of government resentment, right? What is the interaction people have with this society? They don't get, like, good education services provided by the state. They don't get investment projects that build infrastructure and provide people with jobs in the area. They don't get any kind of representation. What they do get is that they are forced by the police to follow laws in which they have no kind of say. We think that is highly likely to cause resentment. Two things happen then in our side of the house. No thanks. The first thing that happens is if we assume that the government is still seen as the body that ought to solve these problems by these people, but is not doing so, these people are being chronically denied anything with regards to infrastructure. If they have high unemployment levels, the government is not trying to solve these problems. That is incredibly problematic. What do we see happening? We think because they can't use persuasion or debate as a means to, persuade, to, to, to tell the people to vote for them because they're now being seen and perceived as being less valuable and less worthy and too stupid to vote. No one's going to listen to the poor people who can't vote, who can't even pass this easy political test. Their only method of changing policy is to use protest and violence. We see this in a lot of situations. Look at Pakistan. The NQM party was systematically disenfranchised. They turned towards terrorism to make policies happen. That's incredibly bad because it solidifies the bad perception of these people. It means innocent people get killed. It means entire areas are destabilized and turned into terrorist hotspots, which is obviously awful because we despise violence within society. But secondly, we say, even if they, uh, if they don't trust the government anymore, you get vigilantism. You get people taking the law into their own hands in these regions because they don't trust that the government will do anything to solve the high crime that spouts when you don't get jobs in areas when people are not being catered for by the government. That's incredibly problematic because it doesn't follow legal process, which means that people who have guns in that society, or men who tend to be stronger in that society, can pass uh, can pass judgments on what ought to happen. So if a woman gets raped, there won't be vigilante justice. But if somebody gets killed, then it's more likely that, that person will be killed. That is unfair. It does not follow any kind of protocol. We're entirely unhappy with that. Team of Denise needs to tell us lots of things, but above all they need to tell us why you have a right to take my vote away because you've systematically failed me by failing to give me any kind of decent education and politics. It is totally unjustified. We are incredibly proud to oppose this motion. <laughs> or seeing a good presence or having
handsome and beautiful people. It's about making a decision based on all information that is presented and that exists in the status quo. A decision that in the end you can live with. Now, two clashes that I will bring to you in my speech. One, on why voting in the end is a privilege that comes with qualification and not a right. And two, on why this political knowledge test will result in better policies and accountability. First, let's talk about why voting is a privilege, not a right. Ladies and gentlemen, voting is not a right that you can just take for granted just like that. We will argue to you that voting is a privilege to a certain extent, because even in the current status quo, there are criteria that you need to fulfill to be able to vote. For example, we don't allow the mentally ill to vote, like how you also need to be above 18 to be able to vote. And it is the case that they themselves conceded that you're considered rational enough to be able to not be swayed by rhetoric, for example. It means that voting in the end is considered a privilege because of two reasons. Number one, it impacts yourself for five years, and number two, it it even impacts other people because your result matter, and hence a potential harm can exist here, similar to the likes of driving. But now they so. try to claim, no, after first class, that we are claiming that these people are illegitimate to be able to vote. Problem is, what we are doing right now is protecting individual position out there. Because the question is, do you as an individual really want to choose this certain person to be your leader? Because we argue that sometimes you just not know. Sometimes you are swayed by the likes of rhetorics into believing that you truly want to choose this individual even though you do not want it. They don't stop wanted for the government to be able to represent the citizen. However, knowing information about manifesto and policy will allow you to truly assess whether this person is the one that you want to lead, even if. In the end, you still choose based on attitudes and characters. It doesn't mean that we ban people from choosing this, ladies and gentlemen. But what we're doing right now is offering you a much better alternative. Because in the end, if you truly want to choose someone based on her attitude or her character or just her gender, we guarantee that in the end, you can truly live with your decision. There will be no loose end and there is no baggage inside of you because you truly have all information. You truly will be able to adjudicate and assess all that information. And you can truly make a decision that you can live with. So we argue that the representativeness of the people is also something that is fulfilled on our side. Before I move on to my next point, yes. In the last presidential election in the United States, only 54.7% of people voted. I mean, your policy, even less number amount of people will vote. Tell me how you reconcile that. Yes, I will, I will answer that inside my second class. Continuing on first. They try to talk about how it's hard for people to get out of this structural poverty. We argue to you that even if you are poor, we already give you an opportunity to be able to vote here, right? Because we already give you free subscription to the likes of news. The only rebuttal for this is that economies is hard to read. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, we also have other methods out there, like it's easy for you to get to watch John Oliver, who is funny and easy to be understood, right? But even if at the end of the day you still don't do this, we argue that at that point it becomes your fault. Because when rights come with qualification, they need to be able to fulfill it to access this kind of right. Just just like getting a driving license require you to be able to learn first. If you don't do it, then you cannot get this right because this will only lead you yourself and other people around you. Last of all, they talk about how there is this current problem of people not reading and we're not changing anything. Look, the reason why in status quo people don't read news that much is because they think that their food does not matter, because their decision does not matter. Such mentality is problematic because this leads into people making decisions that they regret at the end of the day. Take the case of Brexit. Some people don't even know what EU is when they vote for Brexit. They only buy rhetorics coming from Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson and look at where they got us now. Because right now, EU is low, uh, UK is at a lower place than it was before, Pound is at a lower place than it was before. Now we argue that what we're doing right now is giving an urgency that knowledge do matter because it ties with the need to vote and voting eventually matter because it shapes your country for the next five years. What we're doing is sending a message in the most direct form possible. That ends my first class. Let's move to my second class. Before that, yes. If many poor people and minorities are shut out from voting, why would the government devote resources to educate these people in the hope that they pass the test, rather than concentrate on the remainder who will definitely vote in the election? Yes, let's talk about that inside my second class. Let's talk about why this will make better. First, let's address their biggest problem, that poor people won't be able to vote. They try to talk about how political parties will right. only focus to a certain group, in this case they're claiming it is the rich, those that are privileged. We disagree with this. 
We argue that political party will always care about the swing voters out there, even if they're the major, we argue that they will still care. Why? Because in the status quo that we have today, we're facing a case of political polarization on how you can no longer ignore one side because the politics have been so polarized and divided that guaranteeing your own voter is not enough to truly lead the country and become the leading person or the party inside the political realm. For example, Obama gets to be president, and he's a Democrat, but the parliament in US is controlled by a Republican. Hence, the, any policy that wants to be passed will face a deadlock. This is the reason why, in the end, parties from one side will always want voters from the other side as well. And we argue that for this exact reason, people and this politician and these parties who support them, the rich will also want to get the vote of the poor as well to guarantee that such political deadlock will not happen at the end of the day. So we argue that their concern does not even matter. Then they talk about violence and vigilantism. We argue that this will not happen, right? Because debate and discourse and criticism will be much easier in their case. Because you have been educated with knowledge about these policies and you've been educated with the manifesto. And thus, when there's something that you disagree with, it's very much easier for you to defend your stance. And furthermore, we argue that violence and vigilantism is still something that we ban to begin with. So we don't see any urgency coming from their case. But even more. What we bring to you that is never rebutted by them, two things. Number one, we bring to you about the change of campaign that we will accommodate in our case. Because right now, what we are doing right now is that the campaign that you make can no longer rely on the likes of rhetorics, on people like Justin Trudeau using his looks, being a boxer and showing inside Marvel Comics to be a good politician. We change such kind of campaign. Boy. Because right now, what we're doing right now is that, as my first speaker has stated, that we're making better campaign methods where you need to explain whether your policy is sustainable to begin with. Even tax reforms in Bernie Sanders some. are sometimes unsustainable. And we want the campaign to change, not only based on the topics but on real information. This is something that's very important as they were rebutted by the living. Now furthermore, my second speaker also talked about accountability. But now what will happen in our case is that at the very least you can better demand accountability from the government. Because right now Government tend to squirrel around. When the people demand accountability, they simply claim that they never promised that. They simply claim that their party has a different manifesto and their party have a different set of belief. Right now, with a political education, at the very least, people can employ this education to demand a real accountability and truly can demand because based on your party manifesto, based on your campaign policy, that this supposedly should happen. So therefore, we argue that accountability better exists in our case, and that's why India democracy also better exists in our case. So we argue to you that our case at the very least bring a better result and better policies at the end of the day this is no longer based on rhetoric and it also create a better accountability at the end of the day so we have proven to you that voting is a privilege not our right and this political knowledge will result in a better policy and accountability voting is about knowing what's best for ourselves under the recent goal in Indonesia
Number one, whether or not people are actually going to be incentivized to vote. And number two, what which side is upholding democracy better. Let's start off with the first issue. The first claim they made here was that people will have an incentive to vote. We say claim because they actually never really substantiated on this, right? Because the only thing they said was, we're going to provide these people with the economists, we're going to like socialize them, quote unquote, and so then they're going to be incentivized to vote because if they don't vote, uh, because if, if they don't pass these tests, the right to vote will be taken away. We asked you in a PUI, ladies and gentlemen, whether the voter turnout in last year's US presidential election was 54.7%. In Pakistan, the last election voter turnout was 44%. The reason why you have these stats is because, because these people are anyways not incentivized to go out and vote. So if their claim is that the fact that their right to vote will be taken away will be incentive enough for them to read The Economist and go out and vote, show us why that does not happen in the status quo when a large part, majority of the population does not care if they go out and vote because they don't really care what happens. What's happening in their world, ladies and gentlemen, is that there's going to be no incentive for even those 54% to now go out and vote because they know that in order for them to vote, they have to pass this really long test, which they really don't have much time to study for and not much time to go into. They'd rather, rather enjoy the national holiday side proposition is giving them. Secondly, we said that the, what's going to happen now is that they're going to, in, on their world, they're going to have a 22% voter turnout because this, uh, this stat will fill decrease. So essentially, they're standing for a super undemocratic principle where government really reflects the opinion of the five super smart people who had enough time to read The Economist and pass your vote, right? And the second thing, in my, sec my, uh, my, in my second speaker's argument, he talked about why this is such a big issue, how this will lead to backlash. And the only, the only refutation they had to our entire argument on backlash was we will ban vigilantism. Ladies and gentlemen, vigilantism is already banned, right? The places you're talking about, places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, South Africa, vigilantism is already banned. You already have laws preventing this. In fact, now you're going to make it worse because the government will have no active incentive to care about these specific areas where you will have these things happening because those things People are already in the minority group and will have been politically disenfranchised from a democratic system. Moving on to our second issue, which is about democracy. No, thank you, sir. They said this will lead to an informed decision and a better voter base. Firstly, we challenge that, right? Is passing a fact test really ensuring that they actually know everything there is to know about every single political party and all of your political system. Not really, right? It's an assumption for them to say that these people are going to pass this test and have acquired all of this wonderful knowledge, which will make them so much more informed than all those rallies were making them from before, right? And secondly, we said that which, which, which tackles the entire point of rhetoric and Nigel Farage and Brexit and how people are going to be able to sway other people. We challenge that because we feel there's no link between showing us how these people sitting these tests is going to stop them from being swayed by political parties and by Nigel Farage and will not make them uh, will make them vote to stay in favor and stay inside um, the European Union. There was no real link over there, never really substantiated. Secondly, right, to the informed decision, we say this depends on what you put in the test. And this is something my second speaker talked about, something they never really tackled. So here's the issue. So if you're putting basic gender knowledge in the test, i.e. super basic knowledge, right? about how the political system works, then we're assuming you're not really putting in the entirety of the clauses of UKIP policy, which then is not really solving your issue. Because if your issue if you right now is that your voter base is uninformed about the 32 political parties that are running for election in Pakistan, and you're making a super basic test, then it's not really solving the problem that you are highlighting anyways, because those people are not going to be quizzed or be uh, informed about those things anyway. Um. But let's take them on the second thing, where are they are they putting this stuff in. So essentially, it becomes a non-basic gender knowledge test, right? And then, in which case, they are putting in the entire policy. They're informing you about UKIP and Nigel Farage, which is what they want to do to change the democratic system and hold people accountable, right? Three issues with that. Firstly, how much these people be required to know? Secondly, do I need to know the basic policy of all the 34 political parties that are running for election in Pakistan? If that is the case, how is that fair? Why should I not only need to know about the political party that I am going to vote for? Thirdly, if that is the case, yeah. how many people are actually going to go out there and vote? No, thank you, sir. Chances are 94% of the people in Pakistan who A, can't read The Economist, B, don't have the time, C, will frankly not be bothered to read all of this information, are not going to vote. So you're going to have a democracy, a government elected by 3% of the elite people in your country that can actually read and that fall within their policy, right? Secondly, we thirdly to that we say, we also support basic education, right? And this is something Daffit said. He said, how is it fair for your state to say, we failed you by not teaching you English, and then throw the economist on your face and say, now you have to read this whole copy to come and vote in our 
general elections. We say fix the problem before throwing copies of these magazines onto people's faces. We do support basic education, and we feel the reason why you have uninformed decisions being made in these countries is because there's a lack of basic education. So let's start by tackling that first rather than making these people um, pass the general knowledge test. Lastly, to the informed decision point, right? We say voting is subjective. We say it's not okay for team proposition to come up here and pass subjective value judgment on what voting is and what correct voting is, and not even show us how they're leading to the kind of correct voting they want to be proposing in their model, right? We think it's extremely rude and unrealistic of them to uh, assume that the average voter base is dumb and can't vote for who they think will best represent them in general elections, right? And we feel that's why our, our policy of our rallies and how uh, the the political parties essentially campaign and do spread the information that is relevant for the voter base and that spreading this information is enough to hold them accountable in the end and they don't fulfill these actual policies is enough, right? And that's what's going to work in 97% of their countries where the average voter base can't really read English, doesn't really have much time. I will take a PUI and ask to bring to offer one. Number one, the economist is not the only option out there. Number two, would the manifesto made by UK be counterbalanced by manifesto made by Labour and Conservative? Pardon? Sorry, sir, read your second question. Wouldn't the manifesto made by you be counterbalanced by manifesto made by Labour? Okay, so essentially what you're saying is these basic gender knowledge tests are going to contain the entire UKIP manifesto and the entire Labour manifesto. That's the only case in that policy work. And the second thing is that the economist is not the only option. That isn't really the argument you're trying to make, right? It doesn't really matter if you should shove the Times in their face or any other newspaper. Point is these people are not educated enough, they don't have time enough, your government has failed them, and they cannot hold them accountable for that by, by opposing this policy. Then we said, they said this would lead to better democracy. And here's the issue with that. Our entire first speaker's line of argument is something we now have to unfortunately tackle and reply. He told you about how you have different minority groups within society, right? So for instance, within the United States of America, the, uh, the way these tests may be framed is that um, <coughs> Uh, they may target groups that don't specifically have a knowledge about that particular thing. For instance, right, uh, answers uh, to these particular tests may seem more obvious to the whites in your country. Secondly, you talked about countries like Pakistan, which really haven't edu educated enough people enough to vote for these issues in the, second, in the first place. So how is this essentially making it worse, right? Because now what's going to happen is that you're going to have an undemocratic uh, democracy in which your majority is going to be ignored. And this is important because the minorities which weren't able to pass your test and that are in most need of government policy will now be disenfranchised in your political system and your government will now have absolutely no reason to make policies that benefit them because they know these people will never be considered in their re-election anyway. Our entire argument that wasn't really tough, right? And so, for all these reasons, because their entire argument about accountability never really stood in the, in, in, in the second place, because they're not assuring accountability for the 98% that passed this test, and because um, our arguments still stand, and my second speaker's argument wasn't refuted at all, we think we win this debate. Speaking time was 8 minutes and 11 seconds. Slightly first. Now let's look at how she survives in the world of Team Indonesia and to the world of Team Wills. Let's take a look into the world of Team Indonesia. It was a world that wanted to judge these poor people. It was a world that stood on contradictory principles. 
It was the one that came out in the first speaker and said that their model is an extrapolation of children not being able to vote. Then we said, really guys? We told you that there's a qualitative difference between a child and a person who fails your test because he lives in structured poverty. The difference is, someone who lives in structured poverty and therefore do not have the ability to educate themselves, but more importantly finds it very hard to pass your test, who will find it very difficult to gain the right to vote, as opposed to a child who just has to grow up and get the right to vote. So we said on the first level, your principle is not analogous, on that ground alone, you cannot stand. They then said, maybe, maybe no, 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 no. Our principle is based on, if you, they, you can't vote in an election if you harm others with your vote. Wait a minute, guys. What happened to what your first speaker said, that voting is voting for ourselves, we don't understand the logic. But secondly, we said that what if this means that a poor person votes to increase taxes on the rich? Should they too now be allowed to vote as well? We got no response from the side of the house. We take it as a concession of principles on their side. It was a vote where the government can now set the test. But we said, wait a minute, that means the government now can deliberately set a test in a way that makes it harder for people that vote against them to actually pass this test. So you get to give the government a lot of power in actually staying within office. We say this was a huge problem for democracy, we heard no response. It was a vote that was not very grounded in reality. We also vote that things that the governments would focus their resources on people who fail the test as opposed to people who have already passed the test and should get their vote. We don't think this is realistic, we don't think they stand. It also vote where solutions don't work. Panel, recognize the people who fail the test from Team Indonesia fail because they do not have sufficient political knowledge. They fail because they do not read the newspapers or the economists enough. Their solution was to throw more economists and newspapers at them. I'm sorry, the reason why they failed to begin with is because they didn't read enough, which is the reason why they're in this position to begin with. The solution is not that program that you want to have us believe. We think it simply does not work. And finally, it was a world where the basic framework of society will be undermined because you have whole throngs of people who no longer have rights, and instead of expressing themselves by the ballot, they use violence and vigilantism. This was a central point brought to you in our second speaker, we had no response. Panel, this is a very important point that still remains standing. Because in regions like North Waziristan and Pakistan, which I say is going to talk to you about, where the governments just don't listen or care about those people, that's when those people have to express themselves and defend themselves and protect themselves via joining terrorist groups and using violence to actually protect themselves. And that's why we say all the harms on the other side of the house actually occur even more. The only response was that we will ban vigilantism. Wait a minute, it was already banned, you don't resolve it at all. Let's go on to the world of team wills. It was a more principled world. It was one that believed that you should not be characterized by who you are or who you were born in. We recognize that rich and poor people are different, but we recognize that that shouldn't be, an that shouldn't be a differentiating factor as to whether people have the right to vote. It was a world where we empower people, poor people, to use their vote to get the government to start caring about them and therefore start caring more about their interests. Contrast this to the world of Team Indonesia, where poor people consistently fail these tests and not be able to vote, therefore the government focus, not focus on them even more, and therefore these regions become even more depraved and impoverished, and that's where all the harms that we are trying to prevent happen even more on their side of the house. Panel, outside the house is one that cares about people because we have principle. We recognize democracy is about distributing power to everyone. We recognize that it's not a perfect model on our side of the house, but it's a far better model that allows all these people to stand. They talk about accountability, recognize they only have accountability for people who pass the test, what about the majority of those who do not pass the test? Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, this debate is a debate about principles, and for all these reasons, we're very proud to oppose. Speaking time was four minutes and four seconds. Thank you for your speech. speaker comes up here and tells us that this debate is about principle when they're the ones who consistently talks about practicality about how the economy is difficult to understand about how manifestos are thick about how the government sets these tests in the end of the day we think that we can translate magazines summer manifestos or set up an independent body to administer these tests we think that practicality is not that of a matter in today's debate 
But even though we give them the benefit of practicality, we believe that our principle still stands because they did not hear my line of argumentation that an uninformed decision should be limited because it will harm yourself. So let's compare two worlds. Their world, where everyone can vote, but based on arbitrary factors that will only harm yourself at the end of the day when these candidates don't represent you. Or a world where maybe at the first, only a small percentage of people can vote, but at the end of the day, can benefit everyone in that world. So let's look at their best case scenario. Their best case scenario is that everyone gets a chance to vote. Why? Because you're subject to the law, and that means you have a right to set what the law is. But ladies and gentlemen, how do you set what the law is when you don't know and don't understand what the law is in itself? We believe that when everyone gets a chance to vote without knowing that the politician will represent them, will actually harm, or, harm yourself, and this has not been responded adequately by them. And I have told you that because you can vote for a person, that policy might not necessarily represent you, as I have told you with the examples of how politicians might not even provide you with those benefits that you want at the end of the day. So when you're not represented, what you'll feel is regret, but more than that, you'll also feel the practical harms of actually already choosing the wrong candidate because you don't have that information, because you don't have our proposal at the end of the day. But second of all, on their worst case scenario. Their worst case scenario is that everyone don't get a chance to vote. But that scenario already exists, ladies and gentlemen. And they talk about how they're defending this proposal of basic knowledge that we provide in schools. But that's the very reason why small minorities who do vote are easily swayed by reports because they're only limited to this basic knowledge and they are not exposed to the nuances of political conversation that Team Indonesia has so vehemently tried to push in today's debate. Well, let's compare that worst case scenario where people harm themselves with our worst case scenario. We concede that maybe only affluent people can be benefited in the short term. But let's take a look in that period surrounding the first or the second election. The poor so wants to be heard. They want to change the government to actually benefit themselves. So they furiously scribble in those newspapers. They will watch in from the government socialization campaigns. They go to internet and watch John Oliver. In the long term, the poor people will actually be part of the voting bloc, and politicians will want to represent them at the end of the day. Even better, this is a world that is even better, where they themselves, in their status quo, where poor, the poor cannot even have a say on these policies. They have never engaged to why this long-term world is bad in the first place, because we think that's a perfectly good point. And they said that we haven't responded to their point about vigilantism. But we have, because when people are educated, we have better discourse. And that directly brings me to my second speaker argument, which is about accountability how people will actually be able to pinpoint mistakes government make and will actually be able to demand the government to change while having the credibility to do that because they now have the adequate information to actually tell the government this is what you need to change. And this has never been responded by the second and third speaker, even though their third, second speakers, their second speaker's point directly clashes to that point about changing governments and about how we create a stable government that actually benefits under our society. Once again, my third speaker have already told you and have not been responded by their third speaker as well that how politicians will now not only use rhetorics but also make better policies in order to sway the voting bloc. That's why we believe that Team Indonesia wins today's debate. We're proud.